now Shri Jawar Sarkar. The government has purchased Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bora ji. Shri Jawar Sarkar. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is my yes, maiden speech. Yes, he's in the Lok Sabha. The first speech I'm going to make in Parliament after a patient wait of six months. I have months. called up uh, Jawar Sarkar ji. You can say it in your speech. You can react. Madam Chair. Jawar Sarkar ji. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. In yes, Sarkar ji. Huh. Yes. Madam Chair, thank you for the opportunity of me to speak before this August House. I celebrate the sixth month of my oath taking. So I have not spoken a single word in Could six months. Could you sit down and sp uh, speak so that you are more audible? Uh, shall Sir I Karji, sit down? You, yes, please, so that okay. you will be more audible. So, That's right. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is the sixth month of my oath taking, and thank you very much for the first opportunity to speak in six months. I hope you would be gracious enough to give me the time allotted to maiden speeches. Uh, we have heard a lot of Modi Nama for the last couple of days in a manner that puts anyone to shame, anyone with certain amount of self-respect. India is today at the crossroads as it has never been before. Indian history is going to be judged on what we do today and what we do for tomorrow. Our polity is shattered. Our political Framework has never been so threatened. The political framework created by those who fought for India's freedom, those who did not, not by those who ran away from India's freedom struggle. Our society is fractured. Brother is against brother, and it is now a credit to discredit someone else. Our economy is mauled. It has never gone through such a bad path. I have worked for 41 years in government, and I know that we have never, never gone through such a bad patch, not even in 1991. And much of the destruction of the economy is thanks to deliberate policies that have not understood their meaning. The first two problems that I would highlight are inequality or inequity and joblessness. For God's sake, as the representatives of the people of India, we need to understand that the printed word and the flowery phrase do not mean much to those who go hungry, those who are without jobs. As we stand and talk today, 100 crores is the labor uh, force between 15 and 64. Between 15 and 64, government has said there are 100 crore people, and it is government and CMI and others who have ad admitted that only 40% is a labor participation ratio. This means, in effect, that 60 crore Indians have no job security. No job security. We need not quibble over the exact number of unemployed, those who are without any job whatsoever, forget security. It could be around 6 crores. The rate of unemployment has never reached such a devastating portion as it has reached today. On the other hand, we see in this inequitable system, in this open capitalist system that has been ushered in by a certain person in 2014, never before in the history of India have we seen such a naked capitalism. We see that somebody who flew him in a plane has shot up from 14 billion US dollars to 41 billion US dollars. The bottom half of India have lost what they had and they are now holding on to 13% of the national wealth. 13% of the national wealth is held by the bottom half of India, while the top 10% alone, the numbers are just a handful, have abrogated 22%. We can go on figures of poverty because poverty itself is open to definition. One reliable statistic says that about 15 crore Indians were lifted out of poverty in the last te in 10 years from 2006. If you go by that figure, 15 crores lifted out of poverty, we have to see along with it that 14 crores have been pushed into poverty in the last two years. What a credit. Pushing back them, pushing them back into poverty. 
joblessness i have already told you so without an equitable equitable economy what does it matter whether the indian economy reaches 3 trillion or 30 trillion because all of it would be going into the pockets of a few while the others go hungry hunger has already been mentioned to to effect give effect to this what i would say a misconstrued game plan we find privatization has been given much more much more emphasis than ever before in indian history the disinvestment budget for 21-22 is 1.75 lakh crore i wonder how much they have been able to get but over and above this disinvestment is giving it up forever government has come up with a new ploy called the national uh, monetization pipeline this nmp targets 6 lakh crores 6 lakh crores over a period of 5 to 6 years and this year itself i think its target is 88000 crores uh, 20 categories of national assets roads freight corridors railway lines power 6 lakh crore watts 6 lakh crore watts of power gas 8,000 kilometers of gas, 25 airports, and I can go on with the list, would be handed over for a lease period to those who may return them after extracting whatever was there in them. What guarantee is it? What guarantee do we have that after the so-called lease period, we shall be getting those goods that we gave them, if at all we, are, we have to give them? Uh, 1.6, uh, uh, there are hu a large number of coal projects, and we know who is the largest coal handler in India. Again, you come to that same question, for whose benefit are we going for massive privatization? You have not put up any public assets. Who has authorized you? Who has authorized you to sell off family silver? You have not earned it. This is, the, this, is brought, uh, this is developed from the earnings of the taxpayer and by visionary leaders. And you are now tasked yourself with the task of selling them over to people friendly with you. When I use a term like that, let me give you an example. Six airports were privatized. They were privatized to a friend. That is all I need to say. The procedures <coughs> were, were tuned accordingly, as bureaucrats would say, and all six airports went to a person who has never handled an airport in his life, may have only traveled in an airport as a passenger. What happens if he puts on captive rates now? The LIC, LIC is the crown jewel of India. The LIC's worth is around 40 crores, 40 lakh crores. It has six lakh agents and employees. This LIC of 40 lakh crores, you know what 40 lakh crore means? Our budget is normally around the range of 35 lakh crores. So LIC that has built up such and such and such a solid institution is now being diluted in favor of American insurance companies. I'm putting it bluntly, in favor of Amer American insurance companies. Banks, over the last 12 years, banks have given us 16 lakh 55,000 crores of profit, operating profit. <coughs> what you show as actual depends on what you need to force them to deduct for NPAs. While the inflation rate is at 6%, the fixed deposit rate is below 6%, at 5.5%, at 5%. So you, we as a government are actually stealing 1% from the depositor's money by eroding its value every year, eroding its value. Never before has this happened. I look upon two, just two sectors that keep, that ensure that the next generation of Indians are better than what we are, what we were. Education. In education, <coughs> the figure given by the education minister yesterday in a reply to a question, he says that five years ago, the central government contribution to education was 1.07% of the GDP. 1.07% of the GDP. The education minister's reply is that Mr. Modi's government has brought it down this year 
to 0.09, 0.9. He had to come down below even that shameful 1% to below 9%. I understand that you don't understand education. It's all right. You don't need to understand. You can flaunt degrees. The states, the poor states, cash-strapped states, have contributed 3.31% of their money. Uh, th the, what they have contributed amounts to 3.31% of the GDP. <coughs> Therefore, India's total contribution to education to GDP comes to 4.030, thanks to state. <coughs> thanks only to states. But then I find the this, in this government, the left hand does not know what the right hand is doing. The economic survey gives in page 352 <coughs> that the education's percent to GDP is 2.8 percent. Just now, the education minister said it is 4.3 percent. And on page <coughs> 352 of the economic survey, you say 2.1 percent. 2.8 percent to 3.1 3 percent. I saw there's a lot of difference between 4.1% of the GDP, 3.1% of the GDP, and 4.330% of the GDP. Hajaro lakho crore ki fark hai. Education as a percentage of GDP, as I said, has been going down year after year, and you are doing nothing about it. The major schemes in higher education, I was checking, and they have replied that the major scheme for higher education, known as RUSA, Rashtriya Uchatar Siksha Vyan has come down from 1400 crores five years ago to 165 crores this year. From 1400 crores to 165 crores. This is just an example. Just an example. I move on to health. Health, when we talk about India, will not forget those devastating scenes of people, of corpses being burnt on pavements or in parks. Cops is being thrown into rivers to hide figures. The figures that the government of India has given and is repeatedly giving of deaths is challenged by every country in the world, including Burkina Faso. Our statistics have no value whatsoever. We are beating China where credibility is concerned. So we will not forget the massive deaths that happened despite all the drum beating that you undertake now. Why did you not order for vaccine when they were being made in India? Why were you going around the world as a Vishwaguru, as somebody, as a pharmacy of the world, when your own vaccine companies were moving from pillar to post in Delhi, asking for a purchase policy? When they booked these vaccines for a foreign market, you clamped down upon them. And thankfully, you did not declare them anti-nationals, but you got very late. Your late entry into the vaccine market caused an immense number of deaths for which India will never forgive you. On health, our total spend is just 1.2 percent. It's one of the most shameful things that we bow our head in shame when we talk in international forum. It has gone up from 1.2 to 1.8, but even 1.8 is no percentage. Brazil spends 9.2, Bhutan spends 2.5, Russia spends 5.3, and the advanced countries spend at least 5 plus. Do not look only at India shining. You will get the same fate that the person who spoke of India shining God. Look back, look into ourselves, look into these factors, look into factors like health and education. You talk of Ayushman Bharat, you talk of insurance cover, as somebody said, all the money has gone to insurance company. To look at a difference, look, come to West Bengal and see the scheme that we have, we have initiated called Swast Sati. Swast Sati. And you will see that Everyone who <coughs> possible has got a card and can walk into a private hospital free of cost, get paid for it because it's Bengal government pays for them. Look, look at where things are working more positively instead of spending hours and hours in devising alphabet to give fancy names to your schemes with your cronies. Look at the state of institutions, the public institutions that uphold democracy. Try. Telecom Regulatory Authority of India. That's where the game started. Within a week of his coming, that is where the rot begins. 
subsequent chairman of PRAI have facilitated the growth of one telecom empire and have devastated all other telecom companies to the extent that Government of India is forced to buy up the major shares in one limping company. Look at the Election Commission of India. I will not comment about the present commission because we have not had sufficient interaction with them. But the previous commission, consisting of a chief, electoral, uh, chief election commissioner, was and his partisanship is, is, a matter, is a matter that is listed in stone in Nirvachan Sadhan. He tampered with everything in favor of the ruling party. Uh, to give another example of how elections were run, the Central Armed Police Forces sent to Bengal outnumbered the Bengal police. Can you imagine that in Kerala or any other state? That the number of central persons, central armed forces sent to you are double that, are 150% of your own forces. Are you trying to run a colonial state? But then the people gave their verdict. The people's verdict must be remembered. VV Pat, the paper trail, VV Pat was introduced and forced by the Supreme Court to be operationalized. That VV Pat is today uh, undergoing a feet dragging in, 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 uh, with the consent of one particular Chief Justice who has now switched on to the other side. Anyway, our humble submission is that when the 2024 election comes, please be bold enough to utilize the hundreds of crores that you have spent on VV Pat and let two results emanate, one from EVMs and the other from VVPAT. Why do we have to force you? Why, what do you have to hide? Use the VVPAT, use the paper trail. And I challenge them before the Supreme Court and then indulgent Supreme Court that it takes five to six days to count paper trails. I have counted, I don't know how many election results on paper. It never takes that long. Why do you connive with such election bonds? Another institutionalized look at the institutions that we talk about. Prasar Bharati, that I happened to serve, were a difficult period. The last two years that I served under this regime is something that I leave for my biography or something. It was one of the worst. Look at what they have done to the CBI and ED as an instrument of political vendetta. The CBI and ED were excellent professional services let me tell you for the, even those who are angry with them their professionalism is being destroyed by putting henchmen at the top and giving them extension after extension in collusion with legislation the judiciary i'll Honorable not mention member, you'll have to start uh, uh, winding up okay huh? okay the CAG, the I, as a maiden speech, please give me a no, few no, more minutes. Are, your time is that way already consumed. Because it's your maiden speech, we continue to give you another two Okay, okay. 17 plus 15, 32 minutes. 32 minutes is what I'm entitled. But anyway, I'll wind it up. I'll, in honor of the chair, I'll wind it up. Look at the CAGs. Look at the conduct of the CAGs. The last two under this regime compromised to the, such an extent that the nation never came to know the cost of demoratization. The, never, the nation never came to know the cost of the Rafael deal and what was proper and improper about them. And one of them has got a Padma Bhushan for it. Maybe the other should also be given one. The original mastermind who, who actually felled the government uh, in 2014 has, got, has procured more rewards than a gentleman would ever do. In any case, we move on. We come to the last major critical point of federal relations. Remember, the Indian Federation and the Indian civilization came together in an act of unison through voluntary, voluntary, through, through, through their own consensus. We have been ruled by a central authority for less than 500, 500 years. The Mauryas, ruled for over 200 years. The Mughals' effective rule was 120 years. The British' effective rule was 150 years. From 70 to 80% of India was ruled for 500 years by central powers. Our civilization is at least 5,500 years of recorded history, the historical period. And 500 years or less is what central authorities have ruled, which means that for the remaining 5,000 years, Indians have still coalesced together, come together as a civilization because they felt like it. 
because they felt it was conducive. Do not turn that into an instrument of hegemony. Look at how the BSF jurisdiction has been extended without consulting the states. Look at how economic grants to the states are being dealt with. And look at the last blow to the Indian Administrative Service. The Indian Administrative Service shuttles between the center and state. It is not the fault of officers that they don't want to serve the center now. Ten years ago, 309 IAS officers served the center. Today, it should have been 409 against 309. The number has come down to two, two, three. Can't you get the message that they don't want to come and serve under you? You can't use force now to draw them out from their, from their cities and work under you. Force does not work anywhere, everywhere. Out of the 6,500 posts, 1,500 are vacant. For God's sake, you have had seven, eight years to fill them up. Fill them up. Don't hegemonize. Don't bully the state. Don't bully the state. I come down to the last lap of my, uh, of my presentation on, on the president's speech. The entire thing is being run on controls and arrogance. Even Aadhaar, the linking of Aadhaar to voter card, is another indication of this control freak mentality. The central vista is an arrogant display of hubris. There was no need. Please go and see it. Members, please go and see Rajpath. This Rajpath was Rajpath, which was perfectly fine, and it has cost 606 crores. 600 crores to redo the Rajpath and put, put a few lampshades and lampposts and, uh, and, and, and visitor seats. What sort of nonsense is this? It's just a hubris. It's a, it would be much better if you have renamed Rajpath in somebody's name. Six buildings will come up on two sides. Six unimaginative buildings, six unesthetic buildings will be coming up on two sides of Rajpath as a grand plan of the Central Vista by shattering, by breaking down the National Museum, Vigyan Bhavan, National uh, uh, Archives of India, the National Cultural Center, everything has been shattered so that six buildings can come. I have served the Central Bureaucracy, Mr. Modi. You have not served. I know there is no need for it because even if you bring them down to your Modi Nagar, there will still be people who will be working outside. Kindly Draconianism and draconian rule extends now to snooping and Pegasus is the greatest example of how the, the, this state has become a surveillance state. All evidence points out to the surveillance but the government does not have the guts to come out and say no. They send governors with the same intention of disturbing the constitutional mechanism of states, only disturbing the constitution, and the one that we have got will also be, is also the less said the better. As we celebrate 75 years of India's independence, all Indians are bold. We remember with pride the Quit India movement that was led by Mahatma Gandhi, that was opposed by those who are now monopolizing yeah. its celebration. We remember those who went to jail and are today to 15 years in jail and are abused on a daily basis by those who never saw the insides of jail. We are proud of our flag that was opposed in writing in the organizer, the mouthpiece of the RSS, in writing. And this allegiance to the flag was brought in at gunpoint by Sardar Patel, who jailed these people for one and a half years. For one and a half years, Honorable he put the Member, I'm sorry, jail. but you'll have to wind up. Okay, in jail. And in these, we are now told that they are the monopolists of patriotism. This government is not, is not worthy of further discussions because every act that it has undertaken is an act that is that spells out the deep hubris, the the tendency to homogenize a country that is necessarily heterogeneous. Indian civilization will, will thrive on its heterogeneity, not on any enforced homogeneity. Thank you, Chair.